So here we have uh, a wad of clay, uh, two kilograms in mass, and it has some initial velocity. We don't know what it is. That's what we want to find. This is some sort of a hinged stick that has a mass of five kilograms. It's two meters long. And when the wad of clay hits it, it sticks to it, and the two of them swing together up a 40 degree angle before they momentarily come to a stop. And as I said, our job here is to figure out how fast it was going before the collision. So you might recognize this from a previous unit, that this is basically a ballistic pendulum. And uh, just a reminder of our strategy in solving a problem like this. Um, part of the strategy is to recognize that there are three really important locations in this problem. So A is before the collision. B is immediately after the collision. And let me explain by what I mean by that, that you always have to assume in these problems that the collision takes place in a very, very short amount of time. In other words, the clay hits the rod and sticks to it and comes to rest relative to the rod in a very, very short amount of time. That that amount of time is so short that the rod hasn't really had any time at all to begin its upward swing. It, it now has some velocity but it hasn't had the time to actually swing upward any noticeable distance. So that's where B is, right after the collision, but before it's really started to swing upward a noticeable dis uh, distance. C is then when it gets to the highest point. And the strategy here is that we to recognize that between A and B, we're going to use uh, momentum, conservation of momentum, specifically the law of conservation of angular momentum. Uh, but between B and C, we're going to use the law of conservation of energy, what I call UCLUCK. Uh, and the reason for this is really important. Remember that the W in UCLUCK stands for any work that's being done by a non-conservative force. A non-conservative force really is any force that we don't have a potential energy equation for. And so when the clay collides with the stick, they exert a force on each other. And uh, that force does work. It deforms the clay, for example. It creates heat. It creates some sound. Um, and so between A and B, there's that force that does work, and we have no idea how much work it does. It makes it impossible to use ukwuk between A and B. And certainly you can't use ukwuk between A and C either because of that work that's being done during the actual collision itself. Now, after the collision is finished, then the only force that's acting is gravity, which causes this thing to slow down and come to a stop here. So there's no non-conservative forces acting between B and C. We're free to use ukwuk, um, but between A and B, we can't use it. However, it's a collision, which means the two objects exert equal and opposite forces, and in this case, equal and opposite torques on one another, which means that the total angular momentum before and after the collision stays the same. So that's the reason for our strategy. Um, before we go anywhere else, there's a couple of preliminary things that we should figure out. We're going to have to figure out uh, the rotational inertia of the rod. Now, if you look up a long stick in a table, you'll see that 1 12th ml squared is the formula for its rotational uh, inertia around its center of mass, which is right here. And this thing is not rotating around its center of mass, so we need to use the parallel axis theorem, which says that the rotational inertia around a parallel axis is equal to the rotational inertia around the center of mass plus mh squared. h is the distance between the center of mass and the new axis. So in the case of the rod, that's going to be 1 12th ml squared plus m times l over 2 squared. l over 2 because that's the distance between the center of mass and the actual axis in this situation. Um, I'll let you do the math, but basically this comes out to be one-third ml squared. And so in this case, we have one-third, the mass of the rod is five, L is two. So that is uh, four times five is 20, and a third of 20 is six and two-thirds, I think, yes. And uh, so that's what we're gonna use, six.
0.67 kilogram meters squared is the rotational inertia of um, the rod. Now, because the wad of clay is also going to be rotating around this axis of rotation, um, we need the rotational inertia of the clay also. Now here, I'm not giving you the dimensions of the clay. I'm assuming that it is relatively small compared to this distance right here. So that means that basically all of the mass of the clay is the same distance from this axis of rotation. Um, and so that means we can treat it like a particle. And the formula for the rotational inertia of a particle is mr squared. So the mass of the clay is 2. R, and again, in this equation, in the formula for the rotational inertia of a particle, R is not the radius of the particle, because if it's a particle, that means it essentially has no size, so it has no radius. R is the distance between the particle and the axis of rotation. So for the clay, that's the distance between here and there, which is 2 meters. So 2 times 2 squared, which is 8 uh, kilogram meters squared. So uh, those are some rotational inertias that we're going to need later on. So let's dive into um, the law of conservation of angular momentum as we compare location A to location B. We're going to add up all of the angular momentum at A. It has to be equal to all of the angular momentum at B. So A is before the collision occurs. And before the collision occurs, the only motion that we have is the motion of the clay, which is basically moving in a straight line. It's not spinning. So we want to use the straight line formula for angular momentum. Just as a reminder, there's two formulas. I omega is what you tend to use for a spinning object, and uh, m r v sine theta is what you tend to use for an object moving in a straight line. Both of these are L's, but traditionally, uh, when we talk about something moving in a straight line, we use lowercase l. It's not a big deal. It's just different symbols for essentially the same thing, which is angular momentum. So let's do this for the clay. So before the collision, um, clay has a mass of 2. Radius. Radius is how far the clay is from the axis of rotation. And uh, it's easiest to think about that right before the clay hits the stick. So right here, when the clay is right here, right before it hits the stick, how far is it from the axis of rotation? Well, essentially it's 2 meters away. Um, its velocity, we're calling that VO. That's what we're ultimately trying to find, and we don't know what that is. And again, just before the clay hits the rod, the angle between its velocity and the radius would be 90 degrees. So I'm going to do sine of 90 here. By the way, um, angular momentum also has a direction. And you would need to use the right-hand rule to figure out the direction of the angular momentum. In this case, um, you know, it would have a tendency, the clay has a tendency to make the rod rotate like this. Um, so you can see my thumb points out. Uh, and so that's the positive direction. So that's before the collision. Uh, as I said, we would have zero angular momentum for the rod uh, before the collision because it's at rest. Now, after the collision, they are stuck together and they're both rotating around this axis of rotation. So the clay isn't moving in a straight line anymore. Um, they're both rotating. So I'm going to use the formula I omega on that side of the equation. Now this I is the combined rotational inertia of these two things put together because they're stuck together. And so they have a combined uh, final angular velocity. So um, let's take a look at what that's going to look like. So 2 times 2 is 4. Sine of 90 is 1. So this is just 4VO on the left side of the equation. On the right side of the equation, I'm going to add together those two rotational inertias I previously figured out. So 6.67 is the rod. 8 is the clay times their mutual final angular velocity. So you can. this is an important equation, but it has two unknowns. And that's why we now need to take a look at between B and C and use UQUAQ between B and C. We're going to get the angular velocity from that and then bring it back to this equation. So let me uh, flip over to another page, and I'll do UQUAQ on that page. Now, one of the tedious things here is, you know, gravitational potential energy is equal to mgy. And y is just the y coordinate of the center of mass. Let me put that in there. y is the y coordinate of the center of mass of the object. And so in this problem, you weren't uh, really given heights. You were given the fact that it swings up 40 degrees. 
So we're going to have to use some uh, trigonometry to figure out some important y coordinates. So initially, and uh, let's just basically arbitrarily say that the end of the stick when it's hanging straight down, let's say that's where y equals 0. Um, if that's the case, then uh, that's the initial position of the clay. The final position of the clay would be right here. So I need to use some trigonometry to figure out just exactly what that y coordinate is. What I'm going to do, remember this is a 40 degree angle, and this entire stick is 2 meters long. So I'm going to use trigonometry to calculate that right there. Do you see we have a right triangle here? So this leg is adjacent to that 40 degree angle, and 2 meters is the hypotenuse. And so that means that that leg, um, I can use cosine to figure that out. Cosine of 40 equals the adjacent leg divided by the hypotenuse, which is 2. So 2 times the cosine of 40 is equal to that adjacent leg. And uh, let's see what that is. 40, cosine of 40 times 2. That's 1.53 approximately. What I really want to know, though, is this. This is the y coordinate when it's at the greater height. And so I'm just going to subtract 2 minus 1.53. And that's going to give me my answer. So let's do that, and that is 0.468 approximately, so 0.468 meters. So this height right here is 0.468 meters. So that's going to give me the initial height, 0, and the final height, 0.468, of the clay. What about the center of mass of the stick? Well, and I obviously did not draw this to scale, but um, initially the center of mass of the stick is 1 meter high and then that swings up to this location right here. Uh, so I'm going to have to do a similar thing with geometry, where now this hypotenuse is 1 meter, and I'm going to use the cosine function again. So the cosine of 40 equals adjacent over 1, and so the adjacent side is just equal to the cosine of 40, which is 0.766. So, and it's a little messy in this picture. Maybe I'll use a different color. So 0.766 is this distance right here. But what I'm really interested in is this distance right there. So that is basically 2 minus 0.766, because that entire distance is 2 meters. So that is 1.23. So this height right here is 1.23 meters. So that gives us the final height of the center of mass of the stick. Now we can, the rest of this is fairly easy using Ukruk. So let's do that. So I'm going to look at the potential energy at B plus the kinetic energy at B plus any work that's done. And that's equal to the potential energy at C plus the kinetic energy at C. Okay, so B is way down here uh, right after the collision is over. Um, the clay, its potential energy would be 2 times 9.8 times 0. Remember, the y-coordinate of the clay down here is 0. But then the center of mass of the stick would be 5 times 9.8 times 1. The height of the center of mass of the stick is 1 when it's hanging straight down. So those are potential energies at B. What about kinetic energy at B? Now, this is right after the collision, right after the collision. And so together they are rotating. They have one half i omega squared. So one half i is that combined rotational inertia, which was 6.67 plus 8 times final angular velocity squared. That's what we don't know. That's what we're looking for. Um, WNC, there's no friction or any other non conservative forces doing work between B and C. On the right hand side of the equation, Potential energy of the clay is 2 times 9.8. And remember, we figured out that the clay's y-coordinate, when it's at its greatest height, is 0.468. Plus, the stick's center of mass, we figured, is at a location of 1.23. And that's the equation that we need to solve. A um, lot of numbers there, but it really is just a matter of plugging numbers into your calculator. So uh, let me do that. So 2 times, I'm doing this side of the equation first. 2 times 9.8 uh, times 0.468 and then I have 5 times 9.8 times 1.23. I'm going to add those together. Now I'm going to subtract from the other side of the equation. Well, 
that's zero. So I'm just going to subtract this, 5 times 9.8 times 1. All right, so that gives me 20.4428, and that's equal to this term right here. So I'm going to multiply by 2, and then I'm going to divide by the sum of those two, 6.67 plus 8. Divide by that, and then finally, I have to take the square root. And that gives me 1.67 approximately. So the final vol angular velocity, 1.67, uh, whoops, not meters per second, radians per second, um, just after the collision has finished. That's the number we need to go back to our original page and figure out the initial velocity of the wad of clay. So 6.67 plus 8 times 1.67. And uh, let's see what we end up with here. So 6.67 plus 8. And I'm going to multiply those together and then finally divide by 4. And I get 6.12. So finally, after all that work, 6.12 meters per second is the answer to our question.